of the way, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Martin Weiss. Uh, Dr. Weiss is the past medical director of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Mercy Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where he established the Post Polio Clinic in 1987. He Subsequently, became involved in PHI, uh, which was known at, as Jenny at the time. Uh, for the last eight years of his career, he was recruited and joined the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis, where he continued to see post polio patients before finally retiring in July of 2019. He's held multiple positions on the PHI board, including president, and he remains on the board and on PHI's medical advisory committee as well. So, without further ado, I will turn it over to today's speaker, Dr. Martin Weiss. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. I thought it'd be an interesting topic to, to talk about optimizing your experience with your physician. And I'm speaking to you not only as a uh, Physicians since 1977 boarded in internal medicine and rehabilitation medicine, but also a caregiver taking care of a wife who had advanced ovarian cancer, a father with Alzheimer's disease, and a mother with uh, recurrent strokes. I'm also speaking to you as a patient, as I've also had a uh, some significant uh, medical issues with secondary disability, which I've required uh, ongoing uh, intervention and support from the medical profession. Now, what I'd like to do is first talk about picking your physician and how to prepare for that visit how to optimize your time during that visit and the most uh, appropriate follow-up care. Now, each person is going to have an, their own perspective in going in to see their physician. For me, I didn't have any real medical crises till middle age. For many of the people uh, as part of this, uh, discussion at polio when they were small. Many of you had severe pain, generalized pain, had a uh, marked loss of literally control of your body. Some of you had trouble talking or swallowing. Some of you even needed support to uh, breathe. You were dependent on others for your very survival. Um, oftentimes your family is not even allowed to see you. You may have felt abandoned. Um, and oftentimes you had treatments done to you where you were not asked your opinion, but was told what was going to be done. So each person is going to have a different perspective about the healthcare field and their interaction with their Physician, so it's important to be aware of where you're coming from and how you uh, feel best to interact to have optimal uh, outcome for you. Now, the first thing is picking a physician, and I'll start with almost everybody has a family physician, general internist, um, could be ger geriatric specialist, just could be a family practitioner. Um, how do you pick that person? Well, in my case, when I came back to St. Louis, I needed to find a physician. I was fortunate. I was able to ask my partner who he went to. I was able to go to the doctor's lounge and find out where other physicians went to for their care. I found out where the, the nuns went for their care and where the hospital administrators Went, and they all seem to go to the same group. So it was easy for me to decide. And to give you an idea of why I thought this was an ideal group, this group was very accessible. 
um, which is not always the case. When I was uh, recently trying to find a physician for uh, thinning in my bone, I tried to see an osteoporosis specialist. And even being a doctor, uh, recently on the faculty, they said they could squeeze me in in one year, not something very acceptable. My group, where I uh, was originally seen, could see me on short notice. Uh, as an example, my wife uh, suddenly developed marked swelling of her abdomen on a Tuesday night, which even looked seven months pregnant, but being 59 years old, I knew that was most likely not the case. Six o'clock the next morning, I called our physician who said, bring her, bring her in. I'll see her over my lunch hour. So he gave up his lunch to see my wife. It turned out uh, she had problems beyond what could be uh, handled in the office. She went to the emergency room. In her case, she was found to have advanced ovarian cancer. She required surgery. Even though our family physician was not the physician of record for the surgery, he came every day to see my wife and made sure that um, she was getting the best care possible. So that's the type of person you like to have, someone who is very accessible, someone who's very caring, also a physician that uh, will listen to you um, and always be there when you need them. Um, in addition, this group is also very thorough. Um, I went to Boston to uh, accredit the rehabilitation uh, program at Harvard. While there, my my wife decided to join me because her father's from Boston, and to her, she loved Boston. We thought we'd make it a mini honeymoon. Um, well, on her honeymoon night, I promptly fell asleep around nine o'clock in the evening, and a very uneventful uh, second honeymoon. The next morning, my uh, wife told me I'm much too tired. I better be checked out. So I saw our family physician, and he did a uh, thorough assessment. At the very end, palpated a mass that turned out to be the cause of my uh, fatigue. And from that, referred me to appropriate treatment which hadn't been done, I wouldn't be here to talk to you today. Now, in terms of your needs, you need to pick a physician you feel will listen to you, uh, is accessible. You may decide you wanna to go to a, an office which is easily reachable, where there might be a a parking lot close by, you don't have to walk far versus being in, in a huge medical complex when we have to walk 15 minutes to even see that person. You wanna make sure that you have insurance. You wanna make sure that that person is addressing your needs. Um, now, actually seeing that physician, what she do, what she do to prepare yourself for your, your assessment? Ideally, you'd have a notebook, something in a written form, a piece of paper or electronic, whichever you find, uh, works best for you. It should include what your issues of concern are in the order of importance. It should uh, have a symptom diary, which you can use to speak to your physician of whatever needs you might be concerned about. It should list all your diagnoses, both active and past, all your hospitalizations and procedures, all your referring physicians, your medications. It should uh, include your allergies. It should include a medical review of systems. 
it should include uh, your social history and your family history. You also might consider having a durable medical power of attorney, as well as having uh, a dir advanced directive. It's also important to have all your insurance uh, information with you. And I have all of this on a sheet along with uh, a post polio uh, worksheet. So you don't have to take notes. I'll have Brian send this to you after uh, this talk. Um, now, what are the special needs you're being seen because of your uh, polio? Well, the first thing to do is to find a post polio physician. And that can be a real challenge these days. There may only be a quarter of a million individuals in the U.S. who have had paralytic polio out of a population of 330 million. So it's really become an orphan disease. Most likely your family physician has not had many patients with the late effects of polio, the post-polio syndrome. And you may even know more about the post-polio syndrome than your physician. Hopefully your family doctor can refer you to an appropriate person. Uh, it could be a neurologist. We're very well trained in diagnoses, but in general are less trained in chronic management. Uh, it could be an orthopedic surgeon who are very well trained in musculoskeletal structural problems and deal with those with uh, structural solutions, injections, or procedures, but are also less trained in chronic management. You might want to consider uh, a physiatrist, a person with, in physical medicine and rehabilitation. I was trained uh, in this field after my internal medicine training. I can tell you um, what I went through. Uh, I actually had to get a uh, master's degree in rehabilitation medicine. I took courses in anatomy. I took courses on various disease processes that I would see. I had to go to PT school. I had to go to OT school. I had lectures by speech therapists, psychologists, social workers, rehabilitation nurses. I actually had to work in an orthotics laboratory. And I had to work with patients with multiple different uh, disabilities um, to optimize their uh, medical status, their uh, psychological status, their functional status, and also dealt with uh, less directly their spiritual status. So ideally, you might consider someone trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Brian has a uh, list of post-polio clinics or, and or uh, doctors who claim to be experts in uh, the post-polio syndrome. You could ask him if you do not know of someone uh, directly. If not, this might be the one exception where if you don't have someone in your area and you don't even have insurance coverage, you might want to consider a one-time evaluation. And even if you had to pay out of pocket, and oftentimes if you're paying with cash, as a physician's cost is considerably uh, spent on uh, getting insurance payment, they may give you a discount because they don't have that cost with you. Then how would you prepare to see that um, post-polio doctor? Well, I handed out or mailed out a questionnaire in advance and had them fill it out. And I have a copy of the questions that I wanted to have addressed uh, with the information brought in when I examined that person. First of all, I wanted to know uh, documentation that they had polio. I had patients come to my uh, clinic for the post-polio syndrome, it turned out never had polio. 
they had cerebral palsy, they had uh, strokes as infants. Uh, some people were just getting old and weak and achy and lost function and uh, nothing more. Um, I wanted to know where they were hospitalized, uh, for how long. Sometimes I even got medical records, usually uh, copies off microfiche. I wanted to know how much paralysis they had, how many limbs were weak. Uh, I wanted to know their breathing status, so they had to go on a ventilator. I uh, wanted to know any trouble with talking or swallowing. I wanted to know what type of therapy they got, what type of procedures, surgeries they went through. Then I also wanted to have a, a sequence of how they did over their uh, first few years. Uh, did they need uh, a wheelchair? Did they need scooters? Did they need uh, axillary crutches or forearm crutches? Did they need canes? Did they need long leg braces, short leg braces? Were they able to progress to getting rid of their crutches, going to canes, perhaps getting rid of their canes, uh, going from long leg braces to short leg braces, and some getting rid of all aids altogether. Sometimes because they no longer needed them, sometimes they were teenagers and just refused to be seen as being different. Then I wanted to know how they were at their very best. Could they run? Could they do sports? Some were in the military. Some walked with a limp. Uh, what kind of jobs could they do? Then I also wanted to have a Besides their general medical background, wanted to know their uh, social uh, history. Were they married? Uh, they had children. Uh, what was their support system? Um, what was their financial resources? I also wanted to know their living arrangement, their working arrangement. Do they have three flight steps? They had to go up or was on a, was on a one level uh, apartment, but no steps to enter. And then I uh, wanted to know as part of the definition of the post polio syndrome, was there a period of stability, which uh, usually was at least 15 years on average 30 to 40 years. Then I wanted to know when I noticed when things were changing when they knew it had some type of new neuromuscular issues, some functional issues. And I uh, would ask problems based upon the March of Dimes diagnosis of the post polio syndrome. Do they have new weakness? Where was that weakness? Uh, did they have muscle atrophy? Do they have muscle fatigue? Do they have generalized fatigue? Do they have muscle pain? Do they have joint pain? Do they have trouble talking, trouble swallowing, some compromise with their breathing, some uh, compromise with sleep, which often was related to a compromise with breathing. Um, then I go through a more detailed general neuromuscular assessment, try to determine uh, what was going on. I do a detailed uh, physical, especially, especially a neuromuscular examination. I also would do a functional assessment, their uh, dexterity, their arm use in general, how well they could walk. If they walked well, but said they were having problems with catching their toes, even tripping and falling, if they looked good initially. I'd even have them walk up and down the uh, hallway until they were fatigued, where I get a more accurate picture of how they were uh, more at their worst. Uh, then I would do an assessment uh, and plan, and I would dictate my note, I could, with a patient present, and ideally also with a friend or relative 
who could also be there to not only help with giving information, but also hearing what was said and writing down their notes, uh, what our game plan was. At this day and age, also, you can even record that on your uh, cell phone if your physician gives you uh, uh, permission. Uh, I would make appropriate referrals. I would, uh, for testing or to see uh, specialists as need be, I was uh, fortunate enough to work with enough people who knew about post polio to get the right physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, um, rehabilitation psychologist, orthotist, pulmonary sleep doctors, um, whatever the case might be. Um, I also refer them to uh, and then Gin Ginny and then PHI as a general resource. Uh, I refer them to our local post polio support group um, that I arrange for uh, appropriate follow up. And it's, it's important when you are seeing your physician, both initially and in follow up, that you have all your issues written down and being as detailed as possible, such as if you're having pain, what's the characteristics of the pain, what brought it on, if you have trauma or not, uh, what made it worse, did it go anywhere, what made it better, and have that with all your um, concerns, um, and make sure you discuss them in the order of importance, and know how much time you have with a physician. Uh, when I saw a patient, I spent an actual hour just literally with the patient, but I also spent another half hour reviewing records, um, making sure the referrals were done and correcting uh, or dictating my note. If I couldn't do that uh, with the patient uh, present. When I saw them in follow-up, I had half an hour. So you can direct and let the physician know what issues you have, but be aware the last time you have that physician, the fewer questions you can ask for. Again, make sure you ask the most important questions first. Um, and at the very end, it'd be critical the last five to 10 minutes, how much, however much time you have, that um, you make sure that most important question or questions is addressed. Now, ideally, you'd ask that question up front. Uh, what I would not do is I had a, a post-polio patient who I saw on a Tuesday morning who uh, I spent 25 minutes was getting ready to leave. And he said, oh, by the way, doc, which is always a bad sign. Uh, I've been having chest pain and a ache in my left arm. I've had some trouble breathing. Uh, is there anything I should worry about? Well, of course, I was worried about a uh, cardiac event. I asked him, well, did you see your family doctor? What did he say? No. Did he go to the emergency room? No. I was going to see you two days, so I figure I'd just wait. That's not a good idea. You know, depending on your medical needs, make sure it's addressed and addressed in a timely fashion. When you're, again, when you're seen, and in, once you leave the physician's office, it's important to make sure that whatever you discuss, you understand fully. If you have any questions, make sure you ask them before you leave. If you think of things after you get home, you could try to reach the physician by phone, or uh, now you can even email your physician, or uh, if you have my chart, use messaging uh, to ask your questions. Make sure your questions are answered. Follow through with the, the plan of care. For some reason, 
you can't do it. Say there's a medication you can't afford, or you're having bad side effects, uh, you uh, are not happy with the therapist uh, you're seeing. It's important to let your physician know so that uh, you make appropriate adjustments. So. One more thing you should be aware when you see your physician is that times have changed since I first became a physician and ran my own office, was owner of my medical group. Due to the need and federal mandate for all medical records to be an electronic medical record, to be on a computer, and uh, the need to get referrals as well as to be able to negotiate with insurance, large insurance companies for payment, the economics uh, forced more and more physicians to join large networks. How has that worked out? Well, when I talked to my original uh, family physician and asked him how it was working out as I went on the computers and joined the network before I did, I said, well, let me tell you, I just had a order a flu shot. I used to take five seconds to pull out my prescription pad, write flu shot, the name, the date, and the signature. I had to get on the computer. It took me 13 clicks just for that. So you can imagine if everything you have to do is multiplied multiple times, that really eats into the physician's time with you. Um, the other thing is that as physicians join networks, they often were given quotas with how many people they had to see per hour. Uh, my family was a physician with told and follow up. He had 10 minutes. He said, I can't adequately see a physician. Excuse me, I cannot adequately see a patient in 10 minutes. I need at least 20 minutes. And indeed, it took 20 minutes to find uh, my tumor. I would have been missed. And again, I wouldn't be here to talk to you about it today. Unfortunately, uh, for his patients, for the medical field, he said, I had the option to become a concierge doctor and give up two thirds of my patients, which he felt he couldn't do, or to have an army of nurse practitioners and push them uh, patients through like an assembly line. He couldn't do either, so he retired. But the physician has stayed, still now has to work within uh, the network, which is oftentimes directed by the business people. And indeed, if you don't see enough people within uh, the day, They'll come, the, the business people come to your office and tell you, doctor, you're not carrying your full weight. You have to see more patients or else you're going to have to uh, get a cut in salary or else we're going to have to let you go. So just be aware of the uh, limitations a physician also had, not to mention that now the computer is now the center of attention and not the patient and the physician. My solution was to uh, actually uh, not look at the computer, look and talk to the patient, to examine the patient and discuss the care uh, eye to eye. Unfortunately, it didn't leave me any time to do my note. So for every hour I was in clinic, I spent an hour doing my notes and that basically, uh, severely compromised my personal life and was one reason I ultimately uh, retired. So just be aware of the, um, the medical world uh, we're dealing with now. So with that, I'd like to open up uh, questions and uh, comments. I believe uh, Warren Pisco had a question. I'm gonna, he's gonna ask it live. I'm gonna open up his mic right now.
He's still muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question about waning COVID immunity. The FDA just today announced that they are allowing second bivalent booster shots for people who've had all their shots. Uh, and they are allowing, yeah, the bivalents can either be Pfizer or Moderna. And if we get us, if we get another one, do you have any recommendations whether we should get a, have a Pfizer and a, and then a Moderna, a Moderna or a Pfizer, or should we stay with whatever we got first as the second shot? I think that's a question you have to ask your okay. physician. Uh, okay. One versus the other. I'm not sure of any major advantage of one over the other. Of, and uh, the question is uh, getting further COVID uh, vaccinations. Uh, well, I would depend on your, your individual medical situation, whether you're immunocompromised um, or potentially uh, immunocompromised and need the extra protection. But that's something really you should address as your family doctor. Okay, they've also said that the family doctors can now authorize them at a more frequent rate. And so I have the question of, is I, I am severely paralyzed with polio, but don't think I have, you know, I have heart conditions uh, and I use a ventilator for breathing at night, but I think these are all related to not, well, not the heart, but the, they're separated from the polio. Uh, so my question is, is polio by itself, a post-polio by itself, a reason enough to get more frequent COVID, keep our COVID uh, vaccines up to date, if we call it a neurological disease? or it, And if so, how do you recommend that we convince our uh, you know, our, our, our primary care physician uh, to do it. Well, COVID is not primarily a neurologic disease. It has, it has multiple effects uh, on the body. Um, so again, you'll have to speak to your family physician, your pulmonologist, uh, people who might compromise uh, with their breathing, uh, most likely to make sure that the vaccination in general is kept up to date, not just with COVID. And we're still learning the best way to manage COVID as a relatively new disease. And each mutation has its own uh, course. Um, you should get your pneumovax vaccine, uh, you get your flu shots. Um, Again, everyone is individualized uh, in terms of their needs and should talk to your family doctor. Thank you. All right, I think we have another question here from Zoe. Zoe, go hi. ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I think just when post-polio patients thought they at least knew the challenges, if not how to face them. Um, we've come across a situation where medical records are faulty. And I wondered um, how to handle that and what our rights are. Um, for instance, someone close to me with post polio um, has it on his record erroneously that he'd had a stroke. Well, if he's in a position where he can't say, but that's not so that they think they found two years ago, then they may treat him differently. So um, what do you suggest and, and how should that be handled? It's something that's been reported to our doctor, but they don't wanna, there's nothing they seem to be able to do about it. Thank you. One problem once you're on electronic medical records and the diagnosis is there, it's, it's hard to get rid of it. You can, I mean, if it's a legal document, sometimes you, you can't go back and, erase something, 
but you can amend a document and date it uh, for a correction. Um, I've had issues where the medical records were wrong. I had a patient who came to me, was, was hospitalized at the main hospital, came to the rehab hospital, and uh, his record said he was renal failure on dialysis. Well, my patient didn't have renal failure. It turned out he had the exact same name and birthday to someone who did. So all the records got mixed and took us. I was fortunate when I actually set up my records at the rehab hospital, I was able to put in the correct records. It's important to be able to read your records. And at this point, I, I think they've passed regulations that you have a right to see all your records to make uh, corrections. I think it's also helpful to have an electronic or a, a, a notebook with all your correct information to try to get things uh, corrected. Um, it's also important to make sure that you your physician gives you an accurate, a full, complete uh, examination to determine that and to have a open and full discussion to pick up those things. Unfortunately, uh, some physicians find the uh, best way to get a note done so they don't have to spend an hour for every hour in the clinic at home doing notes is to do very short cryptic notes, which are usually not very informative, or they cut and paste and carry on the incorrect information. So uh, I think it's incumbent upon you and you have to just keep on uh, insisting that uh, your physician uh, amend or at least the next note uh, correct your records. Uh, but I admit it, it can be a challenge. Thank you, Dr. Wise. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Ellen Goodman. Hi, doctor. Um, thank you for offering this seminar. Um, in anticipation of the seminar, I this morning called up St. Louis and asked the receptionist to give me the names of some people uh, in the Philadelphia area. Unfortunately, there was only one name. And before I called that doctor, I uh, Googled him. I found the last three uh, uh, patient reviews were pretty horrible. He got one and two, two stars saying he had terrible bedside manner and uh, he didn't look at their records before he um, offered to change their prescriptions for medicines that they had previously been using. Um, I was just wondering how you screen the names of physicians that you give out to people in St. Louis when they're they're looking for help. Well, when I was practicing, I was the one most people uh, refer to. So I, I gave myself a high rating. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of physicians I refer to, say for pulmonary issues, like Warren talked about, uh, I uh, refer to a, a pulmonologist who actually had a fellowship training in neuromuscular pulmonary disease at the Mayo Clinic. I'm very familiar with the post-polio syndrome. He's also very familiar with uh, sleep issues, sleep apnea, which is very common with post-polio people. So I was often able to uh, kill two birds with one stone. With a therapist, 
I knew the therapists who were versed in post polio and knew to treat uh, my patients uh, accordingly and not as a 250 pound uh, linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, which was sometime the case. And of course, those people had bad experiences. Um, in terms of picking a, a physician in Philadelphia, you know, hopefully Brian can give you uh, other names. Perhaps you should uh, check with uh, post polio support groups in the Philadelphia area. I have. They they don't have anyone that they recommend. Okay. Well, the only thing else I might suggest is uh, checking with a major university program where they have a physical medicine and rehabilitation program where at least they have the background to deal with people with complex neuromuscular uh, problems. Indeed, the PM in our field uh, began uh, to deal with the polio epidemics and later also the war injuries. Um, but hopefully there'd be someone in that complex and a large number of uh, faculty members would have the expertise to use the um, rehabilitation um, approach, holistic approach um, to uh, address your needs. Um, there may be a neuromuscular group in the uh, PMNR department or neurology who at least could hopefully give you an appropriate diagnosis at least point you in the right direction for ongoing management. You may have to just go to another city to get your needs addressed. Uh, you may have to consider DC. Uh, you may have to consider the New York area, uh, the Boston area. Um, I mean, we have uh, Experts on our board, uh, Carol Van Vandekar uh, has a huge post polio clinic, but she she's in Sacramento. Um, if absolutely necessary, it may pay. You want to take a vacation, combined vacation with a medical trip, and do a one time assessment and get what you feel to be an adequate workup, and then. Um, take that back to Philadelphia and follow through and to minimize you know, any more costs to see her on telemedicine where possible and uh, still have your needs met. Um, I wish I could help you more. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Rice, we have some questions that were uh, typed into the Q&A uh, we could turn to. Um, one anonymous question says, I'm wondering if certain practices also require or incentivize doctors to have their patients receive certain tests. Is this a common practice too? For the most part, no, the only exception might be an EMG, nerve conduction velocity, which I would do on some of my patients. Uh, I felt the need to document they had prior polio where I could find muscle uh, electronic changes consistent with having denervation and re -innervation. Or if I was looking for another problem, uh, that I was concerned about. I had a patient for post polio who described severe neck pain shooting down uh, her arms and having progressive weakness over weeks and months. And her case actually having sensory deficits, which is not typical with polio. So I was concerned she had a pinched nerve in her neck. And I use an EMG NCV to uh, 
try to define that better. Uh, the other tests, like an MRI of the, the cervical spine, uh, there's no type of direct or indirect uh, reimbursement. And for the most part, uh, there wasn't any type of incentive uh, to refer anyone for any special testing or treatment. But you should ask your, the doctor point blank if they get reimbursed for the test, especially if they're doing it. Um, most of the profits go to the network, and the network makes sure they get the profit, not the doctor. There's also a couple related questions. I'll put these together. Uh, Ken wants to know, how long are medical records kept? How do you suggest requesting them? Uh, notes that there, his records are kept in multiple locations. There's another question too about how, how do you go about obtaining uh, one's former medical records? Well, medical records, I, I kept them uh, forever. And when we were paper charts, once no longer needed, I kept them in storage. Uh, if I ever needed them in the future, um, legally, I can't tell you exactly how long, um, electronic medical records, uh, I would think they keep them as, uh, long as the electronic medical records, uh, are operational, but you should be aware oftentimes when they transition from paper records to electronic medical records, uh, a lot is lost. That's why it's important, again, to have that notebook with all the records to fill in the void. I, I had a close relative who had cancer surgery, and his physician left the group, actually left the medical center, and he went back for a follow-up. They had no record of him even having cancer. So you have to have um, your own records. In terms of requesting records, you uh, need to do it in writing uh, with a physician office for the, to get a medical release or with a hospital. Um, for my patients, when I asked about the original polio records, uh, they had to go to the original hospital, it even still existed, and uh, where it was available, it was usually a micro sheet fish, which they had to uh, print off, uh, but it can be a challenge. But again, it's best to have all your important records uh, in a notebook, uh, either uh, an actual paper or electronic folder uh, to fill that void. Right, uh, and Nick writes, uh, is acupuncture of any help in treating post-polio muscles uh, with regards to weakness or pain? I'm not aware of acupuncture uh, changing strength. Uh, acupuncture has been shown to diminish pain and uh, could be considered for that. Uh, do get acupuncture, make sure it's done by uh, practitioner who's well-trained in acupuncture. Uh, I have a colleague who did specialized training in Eastern medicine, and he said most physicians do not do proper acupuncture uh, technique because when you do that, it actually can be some discomfort in inserting the needles. And so they are very ginger with inserting the needles and stimulating the needles. And you should know, I would think, within uh, two, three, four weeks, whether the acupuncture is helpful or not. And you, you can decide whether it's worth pursuing or not. All right, thank you. Uh, final uh, 
Carol writes, does uh, increase in statin dosage contribute to PPS muscle fatigue? He just wants to know if you have any, any thoughts generally on, on statin use. Well, there's been some concern in the, in the past that statins can cause a muscle uh, compromise. Uh, some of the various, various thinking about that, if someone's on a statin has a lot of muscle uh, pain and weakness, I'll oftentimes take them off the stat and see how they do, see if it makes a difference or not. But that's something that should be in conjunction with that patient's uh, family doctor in terms of uh, alternate uh, management of potential cardiovascular uh, compromise. Okay, I think we have time for about one final question here. I'm going to go to uh, Diane Wall. Hi, thank you very much for um, explaining so much to us about the um, medical world. Uh, well, the business actually of the medical world. I am now in the transition of um, having my new physiatrist and I establish a relationship. And from everything, tell me if I am paraphrasing this correctly. You're very clear that we do have to be our own advocate and we have to do our homework. We have to keep our notes. We have to have our notes. And I have always thought that it keeps me on track if I have a list. But in, in your practice, and you've had a lot of experience, do you find that the patient, many patients get um, nervous about seeing a doctor? And do you think explaining yourself is more important than, um, not than listening to the doctor, but do you feel that there is a, a certain amount of advocacy that you have to kind of zero in on. Um, and, and one final thing is, do you think being an advocate can spur some people into being a little frustrated? And that's not ever good <laughs> with doctor-patient relationship, but um, thank you for all your wisdom. Well, all I can tell you is, and I've sometimes seen doctors for uh, critical conversations, uh, both as a patient and as a caregiver. Sometimes my mind turns to much too. Sometimes we can time till I can tear in the headlight. So it's not a yeah. unique experience, even for an uh, experienced physician. So don't feel like you're an exception. Uh, it's important to write everything down in advance, all your issues. It's also important to have someone come with you for important conversations. Oftentimes I'll get information from the uh, a relative or close friend and fill the void of what the issues are or a more complete picture of the actual history. I might ask, uh, post polio patient, how they're doing, they say everything is fine. And then the wife will say, well, you know, you your foot's been dragging a lot more lately and you've been tripping and you've been falling. Yep. And now, now it used to be that you could work on the yard every spring for three days, two, three days straight. And now after half a day, you come in and you're wasted. You're achy, you're exhausted. You can't do much and it takes you a couple of days to recover. It's helpful to have that additional information. It's also helpful to have that person not only fill in the blanks of the history, but also to be a second set of ears to uh, understand what the doctor uh, said. I have a friend who just had a stem cell transplant, and afterwards uh, he discussed his visit with his wife who's also with him. 
and they'll come back with remembering different things of the same assessment. So it's important to have someone with you for that. It's important to write down not only your questions, the order of importance, but also uh, the answers to your questions. And again, if the doctor gives you permission, you might even consider uh, recording it so you can listen to it uh, at a later day when you're more relaxed. And if you still have issues, see, uh, uh, address that with your physician. And if you feel your physician is not addressing your needs, is not helpful, it's important just find another physician. There's no crime. You have to advocate for yourself. If your physician just is not meeting your needs, or your the personalities just don't mesh, not the right chemistry, uh, look for someone else. Um, I've had people who came to me for a second opinion, and I've had people who went to others for a second opinion. It didn't bother me as a as a uh, physician. Indeed, I used to call it the Mayo syndrome, where uh, someone would go to the Mayo Clinic, and nine tens out of nine times out of 10, they have the same conclusion and treatment plan. And I felt re, uh, reinforced what I did was uh, appropriate. They came up with something that I missed or a, a new option that might be helpful with my other patients. It didn't bother me. I was thankful. I had another uh, arrow in my quiver that I could use um, with the rest of my uh, post-polio patients. Good. So again, I think you're doing the right thing to be your own advocate. Thank and you. Don't, you know. Thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time for today. If you didn't have a chance to get your questions answered, uh, feel free to email them to us at info at post dash polio.org uh, and either Dr. Weiss or another member of our medical advisory committee will be happy to to answer them at a later date.